For a lot of people, getting into privacy means talking about companies like Google, Meta, and Amazon and the way that they track you. It includes things like using encrypted email, secure messengers, and hardened browsers. And these are all really good things. But there are a lot of other threats that lie outside the digital realm of your computer and the internet. There are things like public data and people search websites, and these can be incredibly difficult to stay on top of. In this video, I'm going to explain how your data becomes public and what you can do to stop it. There are a lot of ways to support the new oil and keep us going. And in this video, I'm gonna highlight Monero. Monero is a cryptocurrency, kind of like Bitcoin, but unlike Bitcoin, Monero was built with privacy and anonymity in mind. Monero doesn't require you to jump through all kinds of hoops like using mixers and specific wallets and additional features in order to send money anonymously. You get Monero, you send money, and that's it. Monero is basically digital cash. So if you are looking to take your digital privacy to the next level, I definitely recommend checking out Monero. And while you're at it, you can send a little bit our way. We do spend it like real cash. So your donations will be used. Having said that, we do also accept Bitcoin as well as a plethora of other cryptocurrencies, fiat currencies, and even affiliate links, where if you sign up for a service, we get a small kickback. So there are many ways to support the new oil. Every little bit helps. Thank you so much. Now, quick disclaimer before I jump in. This is an incredibly complex topic. There are a million ways that your data can be entered into the public record, and there's no way I could possibly cover all of them, but I'm going to try and cover some of the most common ones. This video is not meant to be a how-to guide, follow steps one, two, three, and you will be secure and protected. Instead, this video is designed to give you some ideas and get your critical thinking going so that you can identify where the leaks are in your life and some ideas to help patch them up. It should also go without saying that I am not a lawyer and this is not legal advice, so please do what's right for your specific situation and based on the resources you have available to you and don't do anything illegal. Now, as with most things, I think it helps to come up with a definition. What is public data? Because this can really be a broad thing. I define public data to mean anything about you that is publicly available. And that might be a lot more than you think. Now, this could include legally public records like voter records, tax IDs, the Department of Motor Vehicles and things like that. But in my opinion, this could also include forum posts that you've made, public profiles, any of your information that was caught in a data breach like your date of birth or social. It's publicly accessible, so it should be considered. I should also go ahead and define people search websites because I'm gonna be using that term a lot too. People search websites refer to any website whose sole purpose is to list your data. So for example, there's whitepages.com, Spokio, 411, Ben Verified, stuff like that. Now, some of these do paywall their information, but a lot of these search websites will actually show little pieces of information. And by using a lot of them together, you can start to stack together different information to piece it together and make a whole picture. One website may show the last four digits of your phone number. The other one may show the area code. Another website may have three different addresses and another one may only have one. Now, I just listed a few ways that data gets made public. One of the most common ways is public government records or official public records, not necessarily government. And this could include things again, like the DMV, your utility bills, leases and mortgages, arrest records and newspaper announcements. Unfortunately, a lot of these companies and organizations do sell your data to make a little bit of extra money. So that means anytime you rent an apartment or buy a house or renew your driver's license or or get power turned on at the house you just bought. All of that stuff is probably gonna end up on a people search website sooner or later. As I said a minute ago, another common source of data, in my opinion, is data breaches. I don't know how often these get added to people search websites, to be honest with you, but again, the data is still out there. There are tons of resources out there that are not on the dark web that compile data breaches and gather the information for anyone who wants it. Now, to be fair, there are people who have non-criminal reasons for wanting access to breached information. That's how we get those annual lists of worst passwords out there, and that's how we get statistics and research on this kind of stuff. It doesn't make these people criminals to go out and look at the information and aggregate it and come up with statistics, but it's still not good for you because there are a lot more people out there who do want to use that data for malicious purposes. And then, as I said, of course, there's things that you willingly put into the public record, probably without realizing it. Again, things like filling out your Facebook profile or that account you abandoned 10 years ago on MySpace or an old blog or an old Google Drive folder that you made a public link for and never deleted. 
All of this information can and will be found and made public. So what if your information does become public? You should probably start by talking about the risks of this stuff, because a lot of people probably think, so what if my address is online, who cares? Well, for starters, you could be doxxed, and this is where somebody publicly posts your information in the hopes that other people will attack you. You would be amazed what gets people doxxed. It could be as simple as posting a political opinion that somebody didn't like. True story, somebody once tried to dox me on a troll website because I was dating their ex and they didn't like me for it. You can be put on somebody's radar through absolutely no fault of your own. Another risk is stalking. According to the Department of Justice, 14 in every 1,000 people 18 and older will be stalked at any given year. In fact, to be totally honest with you, if you ask the women in your life if they've ever been stalked, you're probably gonna get more yeses than you'd expect. Yes. Obviously, stalking is not something that is exclusively limited to women, but it's unfortunately extremely common with them. And this doesn't have to be physical stalking. Thanks to the internet, this could be somebody on the other side of the world who just stalks your social media and sends things to you and just harasses you despite the fact that you've told them to leave you alone. It is far more common than you would think. And finally, there is a growing trend called swatting. Swatting is when somebody calls the SWAT team in your area and claims to be you at your address holding someone hostage. So the police send out the SWAT team to resolve the situation. This has resulted in deaths before. People who don't know what's going on look out the front door to see what all the commotion is and the police think they're carrying a weapon so they shoot them. True story. Sometimes this could have nothing to do with you. Maybe the previous owner of where you're living now gets swatted, but whoever's trying to swat them has outdated information, so it leads to you. Again, that's a true story. These are not hypotheticals. These things have actually happened. These are just a handful of potential risks, and that doesn't even include the usual corporations stalking you and trying to build all these advertising portfolios. There's risks there too. For example, based on where you live, I can infer the value of the house and the value of the other houses in the neighborhood, and I can figure out about how much money you make. I can figure out your racial demographic, or at least take a pretty good guess at it. Based on who else is listed as living in the house, I might be able to infer your family situation, your sexual orientation, things of that nature. It does not take much for companies to figure things out about you just based on your public data. And as I've said in the past, the more pieces of data you have, the more complete the picture. So this is another piece of the picture that we're going to want to obscure. Having said that, how do you get your data out of the public record? Well, the good news is this can be done. The bad news is it's gonna take some work. It's not difficult or hard. It just takes a lot of time and requires you to be persistent. There are two ways to remove data from the public record. First, let's talk about things like name and address and that kind of stuff that you would find on people's search websites. The first way is to do it manually. And in the show notes, I will have two different sources that will help you do this. It is extremely time consuming. And in many cases, it will require you to spend probably a couple weeks to follow up on these requests and make sure that they have been honored. You may also want to take some additional time to do some researching yourself and see if there's any sites that aren't on these workbooks and lists. The second one is to use an automated resource such as Delete Me, OneRep, or Easy Opt-outs. I think these are really good safety nets to either get started or to clean up any missing loose ends. However, I do think everybody should manually erase their data at least once. Chances are there might be a lot of stuff out there that these services may not catch and you will. I recommend doing the manual opt out at least once when you start your privacy journey and then maybe every couple of years after that. Again, these automated services are great, they're fine, but they're probably gonna miss stuff. So you need to be proactive and stay on top of your own defense. And then real quick, I just wanna give a shout out to the other forms of data like abandoned accounts and public posts. You should make an effort to delete any unused accounts that you are no longer using. For one, this will reduce your attack surface in a data breach. If you don't have an account with that service, there's nothing to steal usually. There are some companies that hold on to this data for a certain amount of time because of regulations or just because they suck. But generally speaking, if you delete your data, most companies will delete it and that will remove it from the record. Again, not always, but usually. If you're unsure of what accounts you have, you can hit up Google and start searching based on usernames that you used to use or email addresses. Yeah, that's right, I said Google. As much as I hate them, they are a really good search engine and they're probably really good for this particular purpose. There are also a host of websites out there where you can put in a username or an email address and they will automatically search the web for you and look through common social media and other popular websites to see if anyone has that username or email. These can be good resources to help you get started on this data removal process. Now, here's the big thing. How do we stop this from happening again? 
Since this data is being pulled from public record, that means it's just gonna repopulate after a while. Well, unfortunately, this is one of those areas where privacy kind of becomes a luxury that you have to pay for. Depending on where you live and the resources available to you, there are ways to keep your data off the public record, but they're usually gonna cost money. One easy and fairly inexpensive method is to get a PO box. Sending everything you buy online to a PO box will ensure that any companies who try to sell your address will not sell your real address and that will stay off the public record. This isn't foolproof, but it does go a very long way. For the DMV, some states offer what's called a nomad license, which is where if you fulfill certain requirements, you can put a private mailbox on your license instead of your actual address. Not all states offer this. When I asked my state about this, they said that they no longer offer this service, but they did tell me that I can use a friend or a relative's address with their consent. So while that's not bulletproof, it definitely is an option. That may not be right for everybody because it's still connected to you and it can still lead back to you in some cases, but it could be an option to start with for some people. For housing utilities and vehicles, there are things like trusts and shell corporations. Each of these comes with pros and cons. Trusts, for example, can be used to buy a home or a car and keep your name off of that public record. Shell corporations are good for corporate rentals or also cars, but they may raise your car insurance rates because it's now a business vehicle, and you may have to pay an annual fee to keep that corporation open in your home state. Also, in most states, the owner of the corporation is made public record, but personally, I don't think that's really a big deal in this situation because you're simply trying to keep your name off of the house. I don't think most people are gonna bother looking up the shell corporation on your house to make sure that it's you. At that point, you're facing a targeted adversary, and this is a different conversation we need to have. Now again, I wanna reiterate, I am not a lawyer, so before you open any trusts or shell corporations, be sure to look into the laws and requirements in your area and what you can and can't do. Now, as far as accounts and other public information like that, like blog posts and stuff, the key there is just to keep a low profile. Don't sign up for accounts unless you absolutely need them. Don't post things unless you absolutely have to. Lock down the settings so that your posts are not public. I also recommend deleting old posts. I actually delete old posts on my Twitter and my Mastodon because they're old. They don't need to be up there anymore. They're not relevant. And that's less data out there about me. And finally, not to self-promote too much, but you can combine all of the information available on my site to help protect you against data breaches. On my site, I talk about using strong passwords and not reusing emails, using masked email addresses, using masked payment information. All of this stuff not only makes your life more convenient and safer, but it keeps that data out of the public sphere where someone can use it against you. Speaking of, one way that you can protect your payment information is by using Monero instead of a debit card. And the new oil accepts Monero in donations if that's one way you want to donate to us. Monero is a cryptocurrency that is private and anonymous by design. So while Bitcoin can be made anonymous and used anonymously, it does require you to have a little bit of knowledge and knowing what you're doing. Monero, on the other hand, you simply just send it off to the person you're sending it to and congratulations, you made an anonymous transaction. So if you are looking for the next step in financial privacy, I definitely recommend checking out Monero. We still do accept donations in Bitcoin, fiat currency, and we have affiliate links where you can sign up for a service and we get a small kickback, which helps support us. Every method of support helps. Thank you so much. So like I said before, this video is not designed to provide any concrete step-by-step -step instructions, but I hope it was helpful anyways. I hope it got you thinking about some of the different ways that your data gets out there and gets you thinking about some of the ways that you can protect it. This is not easy. And like I said, this is one of those areas where privacy costs a little bit of money, which is unfortunate. We shouldn't live in a world where a human right costs money, but unfortunately we do. So your ability to act on this will be heavily dependent on how much money you have at your disposal and how much time you have to research this stuff. But if you do have those resources available to you, I strongly encourage you to look into this because it can be incredibly helpful. And even if you are on a tight budget, I recommend you look into some of the less expensive options like PO boxes and using a friend or relative's address on your driver's license if that's legal where you are. This is one of those areas in privacy where there are no black and white easy answers, but hopefully I've given you a starting point and some things to think about. So good luck out there and stay safe.